So good morning, everybody. My name is Kedar Damle. I work at the other branch of this institute in Bombay, uh, and I'd like to start by thanking Abhishek and the other organizers for this opportunity to advertise some of our work, although it doesn't quite fit into the theme of this workshop very well. Uh, and before I start in earnest, I should say that most of the real work was done by uh, my former student Sambuddha Sanyal, who's somewhere in the audience because he's now a postdoc here at ICT. <laughs> So for all the hard questions, you should contact him after the talk. Uh, so this is going to be a story about uh, an interesting crossover in the chiral universality class of uh, single particle Anderson localization. So that's why it doesn't quite fit into the theme of this workshop. There's nothing very non-equilibrium about it. And it's not many body localization, it's single particle physics. But it starts as a story of uh, um, interacting moments. So in that sense, it is a many body system. So let me say what I mean by that. So let me start with some background because this is a diverse audience. Uh, you know, if you go back to the early 80s literature on uh, phosphorus doped into silicon uh, at very low dilution, at very low concentration, uh, you have this picture of each phosphorus atom forming a sort of a hydrogenic atom where there's a P plus center and an electron orbiting around it with a very large Bohr radius. Uh, and if you're dilute enough, these electrons don't really manage to tunnel from one phosphorus to the other. There's no conduction, there's no impurity band. And it's better to think of this as a system of interacting spin half moments, one moment corresponding to each dopant. Uh, and indeed, at very low densities, experimentally, this is a good electrical insulator. And all the low energy physics is then the physics of these spin half moments. So that's the sort of starting picture. Uh, and then, of course, uh, although the electrons can't tunnel in real terms from one atom to the other, they can make virtual hops to a neighboring atom and come back. And that mediates a spin exchange interaction, which is antiferromagnetic, but with a very broad distribution of coupling constants. So all the JIJs are positive, but they range in energies over a very broad range. Uh, and you're left then with this, this sort of a description where uh, you have moments that are embedded in your silicon crystal uh, at random locations, very low dilution, and each moment is talking to every other moment through this GIG. And the question is, what is the low energy spin physics of a system like this? And this was discussed many years ago, um, more than 35 years ago, maybe 35 years ago. And uh, a very simple phenomenology was suggested. And the idea was that uh, the system at low temperature forms basically a bunch of singlets, each spin finds some other spin to bind into a singlet width. And uh, these pairs can have a whole range of length scales over which they form and corresponding range of energy scales. And at any given temperature T, uh, only the, the singlet pairs whose binding energy is smaller than the temperature become active or, or remain active. Uh, and uh, all the other uh, higher binding energy pairs are frozen. And so this gives you this phenomenology where uh, the susceptibility at any given temperature is just 1 over temperature times the fraction of uh, pairs that have binding energy less than temperature. And this was made quantitative by Bhatt and Lee, uh, who argued that this leads to a susceptibility that goes as a power law, uh, which diverges as a power law with temperature, at low temperature. So it's not quite a Curie tail. It's not 1 over temperature. Uh, because n of t is vanishing in some way with temperature, as temperature goes to zero. It's a weaker power law divergence, where this coefficient alpha, this uh, power, is set by the concentration of the phosphorus. So this was the phenomenology, uh, which came to be known as sort of Buckley physics, in some circles at least. Uh, and the question is, is this asymptotically exact? Is this really what happens at very, very low temperature? Uh, and in one dimension, uh, it's known that this picture is actually exact uh, for the random exchange antiferromagnetic chain. There's essentially an exact solution that started with Dasgupta and Ma and was completed by Daniel Fisher, where this function uh, n of t behaves as 1 over gamma square. And gamma is always uh, the temperature scale in logarithmic units. So it's gamma of t is log of j over t, where j is some overall scale of energy. So that's how this function vanishes. And so uh, the susceptibility is basically as close to being a Curie tail as you can without being a Curie tail. 
uh, for D greater than one, I think the status. It's fair to say that the status of this this phenomenology uh, was unclear for a very long time, and maybe it's still unclear in the published literature. I'm not sure, but I do remember there were some unpublished results, and maybe David can talk about them in privately, where they looked at it and asked whether the flows go to strong disorder, which would make this picture exact. And it turned out that they don't really the distributions don't really broaden. The flows don't really go to infinite disorder. So the strong disorder Raji is inconclusive at best. At worst, it says that this phenomenology is only a crossover. I think that's maybe a fair description of what happens. So the question has then been for a long time, are there examples in higher dimension, dimension bigger than one, where this very attractive picture uh, can be uh, made into more than a picture, can be made into something that's an asymptotically exact statement about the physics of some many body system. Uh, so you want a system of interacting spin half moments with full SU2 invariance and you want to apply a magnetic field and you want to ask whether the susceptibility can be thought of in terms like this. And I'm not quite sure I know the answer to that, but I can show you at least today uh, one example where the answers look a lot like what you would expect if this picture was valid and then you can backtrack and say maybe that's enough reason to start thinking that this picture makes sense. So the example I'm going to tell you about is a diluted uh, uh, magnet. Uh, it's a toy model. It's a simple, exactly soluble model for a phase of matter that's come to be known as a Majorana spin liquid. So this is a system of interacting spin half moments with full SU2 invariance, uh, where the elementary excitations are spin carrying Majorana fermions, and the ground state is a spin liquid. And uh, I'm going to show you that, uh, at least as far as we can tell, uh, the susceptibility in this example that I have behaves like this. So there's a piece which is just a Curie tail with a coefficient c, which is non-universal and depends on the density of vacancies I put into my diluted magnet. And then there's a piece that looks very much like this one-dimensional physics, uh, except in some details having to do with the way n of gamma vanishes as temperature goes to zero. And this function n of gamma, which basically is uh, to be mapped to in some picture, in some crude picture, to the number of moments that have remained free and able to fluctuate down to temperature t. So this is the number of active moments at temperature t. It's that function that displays this advertised crossover that's in the title of the talk. Uh, it goes from being a power law uh, at intermediate scales, uh, temperatures much less than j but much bigger than some crossover temperature. So it goes from being a power law in this intermediate regime to being a stretched exponential, basically. And uh, I'll tell you why this crossover is an interesting thing from the point of view of Anderson localization in the bipartite random universality class. So that's, that's what I hope to convince you of. <coughs> so uh, you know, this is the result, but then you, the, the, the interpretation I'd like to suggest for it is what I was alluding to. Following button Lee, I'd like to think of C as the density of free moments, moments that never bind into a singlet with any other spin all the way down to zero temperature. They're really isolated spin off variables. And I'd like to think of N of gamma as the density of singlet pairs with binding energy smaller than temperature. Now, this is a very attractive sort of uh, picture, but the problem is the way I do the calculation has nothing to do with this picture. And uh, an open question, which I hope you think will is interesting, is whether you can actually come up with an alternate uh, renormalization group approach that makes this picture more plausible or explicit in this system. So here's where the connection to the chiral orthogonal universality class comes in, and this is also how I do the calculations. Uh, so it turns out that in this exactly soluble model of a SU2 invariant Majorana spin liquid, you can uh, do some analog of a jordan wigner transformation and write things in terms of free fermions. And the way it works is that the susceptibility of the original spin system essentially becomes the compressibility of this free fermion system at the particle hole symmetric uh, chemical potential. Uh, and this n of gamma, this function that tells you how many free moments there are at temperature t, is related to the integrated density of states of these single particle uh, of integrated density of single particle state of the single particle spectrum. Uh, and the energy of the fermion single particle state is j times 10 to the minus gamma, where gamma is the logarithmic temperature. 
So that's that's the connection between free fermions and the problem I'm going to talk about, and I'll make this explicit. And then this crossover I'm talking about in here, uh, in this function, uh, is effectively uh, arising from a crossover in the density of states of uh, the bipartite uh, hopping problem in the presence of uh, density of vacancies. So in the diluted bipartite hopping problem. And that's surprising because the low temperature behavior, this form, is what you would expect on general universality grounds in the chiral orthogonal universality class. And somehow it looks like when you put vacancies instead of disordering the system in some other way, there's a very long crossover and a very low temperature scale created for that crossover to happen over which the system doesn't seem to know anything about its ultimate universal physics, uh, which is dictated by symmetry and sets in at really low temperatures. And for a huge intermediate range of temperatures, it behaves in this very anomalous way. So that's interesting from the point of view of the theory of Anderson localization. And yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Well, I'll show you the model. This was all trying to set the... I'll show you the model. Okay, thanks. In a minute. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. So, if there's no questions about where I'm heading, I can uh, show you what I'm doing actually to get these results. So, this is basically the summary of the talk given in advance, and now I will. Uh, I would yeah. So I'll tell you how this works, and I should just mention before I actually go to the details that another example of essentially the same crossover is provided by vacancies in undoped graphene. Uh, and the same thing seems to happen there for reasons that are not entirely obvious to us right now, but we have some crude picture. So let me now start the talk proper. So the setting is this so-called mod Yao Li model or Yao Li variant of Kitaev's honeycomb model. So those of you who know Kitaev's honeycomb model know that it's a model of spin half variables on the honeycomb lattice where the honeycomb lattice, of course, has three orientations of bonds, which you can label as Z, X, and Y. And in Kitaev's model, if, if the Pauli matrices tau represent the spin half moments here, then tau Z only interacts with the Z component with, of this spin. Tau X interacts with the X component of this spin. And tau Y interacts with the Y component of that spin. So it's a highly anisotropic model. It's got, it does not have SU2 invariance. It's better to be thought of as some spin orbital model. Um, and this is Kitaev's famous uh, honeycomb model. This is a variant, the one I'm working with, where apart from these tau variables that are coupled in exactly the same way as uh, Kitaev's model, there are actually spin, legitimate spin half moments that just have a S dot S Heisenberg interaction across every bond. But the interaction strength is modulated by this dynamical coupling tau tau. So that's the model. And the physical, uh, <coughs> two, exactly, two that's right. Uh, there's two SU2s inside. One is broken and one is not. Uh, and so that's why it's a, it's a model with single SU2 invariance. And so it, it, actually, the way they got to this model is quite instructive. They started with some decorated honeycomb lattice, which uh, where every site is replaced by a triangle. And the triangle had three spin half variables on it. And then, uh, you know, in a suitable range of uh, couplings in their original model, the physics reduces to the physics of the two doublets possible for three spin half variables, which are distinguished by a chirality. And this tau variable should be thought of as the, uh, as the variable that tells you whether you're in the plus chirality spin half state of this triangle or the minus chirality. And that's why that modulates the exchange of the total spin. So that's, that's their construction. I think it's a very cute construction. Uh, my interest in it was simply that it provides a tractable example of an SU2 invariant system, which is a Majorana spin liquid. And one can start in investigating issues of uh, low temperature susceptibility in the presence of disorder. So that's the model. Uh, and disorder now is going to be for us simply knocking off both the tau and the S variables from a site R. Uh, and the fermionization that works in this case is not the one that Kitaev made famous in his work. It's not the one with four Majorana fermions representing a single spin half variable. It's this more SU2 invariant or SU2 covariant formulation 
where you write one of the Pauli matrices, uh, Pauli matrices as minus i cx cy and cyclic permutations, and the other one as minus i bx by and cyclic permutations. So this can be written as sigma vector equal to c cross c in some condensed notation. So this has uh, this is explicitly SU two invariant each of these formulations, and this is uh, I, I don't know this literature for this goes back actually to Swellick and even before him I think, and it's an alternate way of writing. Uh, spin half moments in terms of Majorana fermions, and this is the one that has six Majoranas. Uh, six Majoranas at each side. That's right. So, so, so yes. But if it's just spin half, yes, I mean, I mean, I it's two spin halves. Yeah, I mean, I mean, Sorry, what do you mean by that? No, no, but this is the point. A single Majorana is four. A single spin half is four Majoranas if you have grown up reading Kitai's paper. Yeah, exactly. Right, yeah. but it doesn't have to be. There are many ways of writing spin in terms of bosons and fermions, and this is another one. This is a nicer one, in my opinion. It's been okay, used. Right. So yeah. What is, the, what is the constraint? Yeah, yeah. So we'll come to that. We'll come to that. So right now, I'm just saying I write each Pauli matrix like this, yeah. and the advantage of doing this is that uh, uh, all commutation relations are preserved without putting in any constraints anywhere. Uh, but you have doubled the states at a single site. There are two Pauli matrices at a site, so there's a four-dimensional Hilbert space. But now you have got uh, eight states in your single particle spectrum. And the constraint is this. The constraint is actually very curious as well, because what happens is your Hilbert space at a site actually makes two copies of the physical Hilbert space. And in both copies, everything is reproduced uh, perfectly faithfully. And so all you've got to do is stay in one copy. Uh, and that's a choice you make. You can stay either in the d equals plus 1 sector or the d equals minus 1 sector. You can see easily that any sigma or tau operator stays within one of these sectors. So that's how you decompose eight states into 4 plus 4. And there are no unphysical states. So in this case, the projection is not getting rid of anything unphysical where commutation relations are not obeyed or anything like that. You're just getting rid of an extra copy when you take the projection. And by sitting in one sector, the advantage is you have this decomposition where you can write sigma times tau as a bilinear in Majorana rather than four Fermi operator. And this makes the problem soluble. So without sort of going into the technical details, you can see that if this is true, and I go back to the Hamiltonian I have written, uh, then each of these terms becomes basically a product of Bs times a product of Cs. And the product of Bs don't appear anywhere else in the Hamiltonian. They commute with everything else. They are the static Z2 gauge fields of this Majorana spin liquid, exactly as in Kitaev's solution. And so you're left with uh, basically three copies of Kitaev's famous Majorana fermion Hamiltonian. In the original Kitaev model, you would have a static gauge field on every bond and a single C Majorana fermion that's hopping in the background of this static gauge field. Here you have three Cs. Perfect SU2 invariance. There's a Zx, Cy, and a Cz. And the external magnetic field couples like that. So you can see by defining canonical fermions, which are Cx minus I, Cy, uh, you can see that Cz is just uh, the number operator for the canonical fermions up to a half. And the susceptibility in the original problem is the compressibility of these Majorana fermions up to projection. So that's the connection to the single particle physics, uh, which I'm going to exploit now. This coefficient u is? This is the static gauge field. Anything? Uh, it's plus 1, minus 1, because it's a product of two Bs. Any scatter? Yeah, yeah, so we have to decide. So the way, the way a single particle problem contains all the physics of the many body system is that you have to solve this problem in every uh, gauge field configuration. So every gauge field sector will give you a fermion determinant. And then the full Hilbert space is all these different fermion determinants for every gauge configuration. And you have to ask where the ground state sits, in what sector of the gauge field. Right? That's the first thing that Kitaev did as well in his model. And the, so that, that's how you get the full many body physics in single particle language. Uh, so if you want to, so to summarize this part, if I want to calculate my susceptibility in this diluted spin liquid, I should write down the Hamiltonian for these F fermions, which is just a tight binding model on the honeycomb lattice with some arbitrary pattern of Z2 fluxes uh, on the honeycomb lattice. 
and I should go into the low temperature sector, which is the sector in which the Z2 fluxes are such that the fermion energy, the energy of the Fermi C is a minimum. And then I should compute the compressibility in that sector. For low enough temperature, that's the answer, up to projection. So I'll come to projection in a minute. And so if you don't worry about the projection, uh, this is the answer where I should work out the total density of states uh, of the single particle problem in the ground state sector for the Z2 fluxes. And I haven't said what that is yet, so I'll come. Yeah, so if you, that's right. That's why you can do this at low temperature. Exactly, exactly, that's right. So at low temperatures, this is perfectly fine, up to some exponential correction. But what sector should I use? Well, before I do that, let me say what, what should I do about the projection. So in the usual Kitaev model, people have analyzed the effects of projection quite carefully in various kinds of calculation. Uh, and actually, much of this relies on some crucial work done by Bhaskaran, uh, Mandal, and Shankar, and also by Yao, Yang, and Kivilson. And building on this, uh, John Chalker and Roderick Messner with their student uh, showed that the only corrections projection gives to all these free Fermi calculations in the usual Kitaev model are corrections that vanish in the thermodynamic limit. And this was made much more precise more recently uh, in Matthias Voita's group and in Daniel Loss's group, where they actually worked out the form of the 1 over L connect corrections. So I think initially the, it was just understood that in the thermodynamic limit they don't matter, but now we even know how the first 1 over L connections look in, in the usual Kitaev model. And what we've been able to do with some help from John Chalker and Roderick Messner is show that all those arguments go through in this case as well. Uh, it requires a little bit more work because the fermionization is different and the projection is different. But the same conclusion holds. Again, uh, the projection only gives terms that vanish in the thermodynamic limit. And one crucial thing that's been recently realized is that, uh, thanks to the work of Matthias Voita actually, is that for specific boundary conditions, even if you can't work out the coefficient of the correction in general, you can find boundary conditions where you know that the correction is zero. And the way this works is there are some boundary induced zero modes for the Majorana fermions that don't enter the Hamiltonian. And you can always trade the constraint against a change in the occupation number of those zero modes. And so you can arrange it so that for semi-open boundary conditions, which is the one we use in our numerics anyway, there are no finite size corrections even introduced by taking uh, the free Fermi answer. The free Fermi answer is essentially exact and does give you the susceptibility of the spin liquid. That's the other conclusion. Uh, I can explain this in more detail uh, on the blackboard later if somebody is interested. And so what about dilution? So dilution simply means I remove the corresponding orbital on the honeycomb lattice. And of course, to avoid some spurious effects, I want to sort of look at a globally compensated system where there's an equal number of vacancies on A and B sublattices. <laughs> and I put in some short distance correlations in my impurity ensemble to prevent disconnecting small clusters of the lattice from everything else, because that would give you spurious effects as well. So you imagine there's some short range repulsion between your vacancies, just to make things well behaved numerically. And now comes the question of the flux sector. So what sector should I do these calculations in? Well, in the pure system, we have an answer which goes back to Lieb's flux theorem, uh, which says that uh, if you have a plaquette whose side length is 2 mod 4, uh, then you should have 0 flux. And if you have a plaquette with a side length uh, 0 mod 4, you should put a pi flux. And that minimizes the energy of the Fermi C quite generally, as long as there's, some ref there's one reflection in your system that doesn't contain sites. That's the only condition the theorem needs. I think this was originally worked out to decide what kind of uh, saddle points give the best energy in some slave fermion theories for high temperature superconductors or something like that. But it's a very useful thing in our context. So it tells us that in the pure problem on the honeycomb lattice, we can just work in the sector where all these Z2 gauge fields are plus one. There's no Z2 flux. And then if I, if, I remove a vacant, if I remove a site, I create a defective plaquette that has side length 12, basically by doing this. So I remove this site. And instead of these three plaquettes of length 6 each, I get this bigger one, like that. I've removed this site. And this has now got uh, a side length of 12 which is 0 mod 4, so I should put a pi flux here. So every vacancy should bind a pi flux. 
So that's the only way this is different from just diluting graphene or the tight binding model for graphene. If you wanted to look at diluted graphene in a tight binding description in the simplest scenario, you would just remove that orbital and do nothing to the hoppings. Here what you need to do is if you remove this site, you must change the sign of this hopping, make it minus, multiply it by minus sign and then do that for a whole string going off to infinity to put a pi flux here. So that's what you need to do. So we do that in our numerics uh, and then we work out. Yeah. The constraint on where the other vacancies are is none of them are on that 12. Yeah, yeah. So I want to avoid, yeah. So I actually the precise thing we do is we say that no two vacancies are either nearest neighbors or next nearest neighbors of each other. That goes. That's. So you're allowed to put it at the third neighbor. At, you're allowed to put it at the third neighbor. You get an even bigger plaquette. We've checked that that doesn't make much of a difference. We have even excluded more. Uh, and we have excluded things from our edges as well. So basically, we have excluded everything that we know of that gives known sources of zero modes in the random hopping problem, in the hopping problem. So we basically have tried to eliminate all sources of zero modes that we know of. Because that's crucial for determining what the robust answer is for this Curie constant. So that's our setup. That's the calculation we want to do. And the choice of geometry, as I said earlier, is actually for numerical reasons semi-open. Uh, we use anti-periodic boundary conditions in one direction and open boundary conditions in the other direction. And uh, we use anti-periodic because we want to, again, satisfy this heuristic of Lieb and loss. Uh, even for the loop that spans the system uh, to again make sure that the uh, fermion uh, energy is minimized. Uh, and we use, so, so this makes sure that we have the right sector and it makes sure that we have no spurious zero modes. That's what our calculation is rigged up to produce. And as I said, we send flux strings off to one edge every time there's a vacancy if we are doing the Kitab model. And if you are doing graphene, we have no flux strings. That's the only difference between the two calculations. So I said that already. And the way we do our calculation is we don't actually calculate any eigenvalues. We count the number of states below some energy or between some energy and zero uh, by using some algorithms that are based on uh, Sturm's theorem of interlacing of eigenvalues of matrices. And we've checked when, whenever we can do the same calculation with LAPAC, we have checked or with any other CAN diagonalization, we have checked that we get the right answer. But unfortunately, in the regime in which we get most interesting results, we don't know any other way to get these results. So we have no independent check. Because what we have done is we've implemented these old Algol routines of Martin and Wilkinson in a fully multi-precision way, so that every calculation is done is done basically by keeping hundreds of digits, 100, 150 digits, and doing long multiplication and long division. I mean, there are packages that uh, you can just plug into any program and you replace the standard multiplication and division by these long multiplications and long divisions. And uh, then you can use arbitrary accuracy. So that's what we do. So what we really do is what I outline here, I think, in the next slide. So for each sample, we first pick a range of log energies uh, and uh, make a grid in log energies, which is very coarse, and ask how many states there are below 10 to the minus gamma. And we put gamma in some grid. And then if the number of states below 10 to the minus gamma and 10 to the minus gamma plus 5 doesn't change, we don't do anything else, we just fill that in. If it changes, we need to know where it changed, then we make the grid finer. And in the end, we've got logarithmic accuracy of a half. So we, you know, it's kind of coarse, but it's enough for what we do. And in this way, we keep going down in energy until we get to the band center. And if states are closer to the band center than 10 to the minus 120 or something like that, we say that's a zero mode empirically. So that's our count of zero modes. So we have some count of zero modes. So in any sample, what Sambuddha does is he gets this staircase. So these are the number of states below this energy. Then is this number, then is this number like that. And then there's this last downward step here, and then a long plateau, like that. And this is gamma, log of, uh, in the notation of the random, of the hopping problem is t over epsilon. t 
is the hopping amplitude which is constant and then epsilon is the energy log to the base 10. So the position of the last downward step is the lowest non-zero gap in the system and this height is the number of zero modes. That's what we do. And then we split our uh, uh, integrated density of states function into two parts. One is this flat part which I call W naught and N of gamma minus the flat part is what I call the, sorry, what did I, yeah. So we split it into two parts, one is N gamma, the other is W naught. And, and then average over a large number of samples. And so here's some formulae that are relevant to what I want to show you in terms of figures and fits. So I, in effect, I'm decomposing the density of states into a regular part and a delta function at the band center. And the integrated density of states corresponding to the regular part is what I'm calling N of gamma. Uh, now, if you are to believe the universal uh, results for uh, Anderson localization in the chiral orthogonal universality class, uh, you expect rho of epsilon to be this stretched exponential in log epsilon, uh, apart from this one or epsilon. Or equivalently, this integrated density of states is a stretched exponential of gamma, where this stretching exponent is three halves. Uh, in one dimension, uh, there's an analogous result where n of gamma would be a power law in gamma. And that's uh, Dyson's original result for the random hopping problem in one dimension. Uh, and so these are the two functional forms that we know uh, are the universal results in one and two dimensions. So since we are in two dimensions, we would expect this to be the final fate of the system. Uh, but let me show you what happens. So first, let's go to the zero modes. W naught. So this is asking what is the fraction of samples out of 4000 which have at least one zero mode. And uh, you can see in the thermodynamic limit every sample has a zero mode, at least one zero mode. So in a large enough system there are zero modes with probability one. That's the first statement I want to make. This is fairly well borne out by the data here. There's a kind of a climb here if, because you need to, if you are at lower concentrations of vacancies, you need to go to much larger sizes to reach the thermodynamic limit. So this is 5% vacancy concentration going up to 10%. So the first statement is there's always a zero mode, at least one zero mode in every sample if the sample is large enough. The second statement is actually the density of zero modes per unit area in a sample goes to a non-zero thermodynamic limit. That's the density. And so there's a, and this is surprising or was surprising to us when we started because we had, we thought, taken care of everything we knew to eliminate zero modes. Uh, you know, any trivial reason for a zero mode, which is because it's near the boundary or it's disconnected, anything we know of is not in here. So the first statement is there are, there are, uh, there's a thermodynamic density of zero modes. The second statement is, is basically this figure. So here's n of gamma, the regular part, apart from the zero modes of the integrated density of states in log variables here. And I'm plotting it as a log log plot. Uh, so a straight line on this plot would be a power law in gamma. And something that curves downwards would be decaying faster than a power law in gamma. And you can see here there's this pretty wide range in gamma going up to gamma of maybe 8, which is 10 to the minus 8. Uh, where uh, in energies, where a power law fits quite well. Uh, and that's what you would expect in one dimension, not two. And then only beyond that scale do I have this drop uh, where I cross over to the more universal stretched exponential behavior, which fits well beyond some scale. And we can do this at the three largest sizes we are at, which are superimposed on this curve. Or we can carefully take a pointwise extrapolation and do it in the thermodynamic limit, the answer doesn't change. And the same physics is seen at basically all the concentrations we look at. Uh, at higher concentrations, the crossover happens at much higher energies. So gamma is much smaller uh, and it's not a very low energy scale, it's easy to see. But if you are at low concentrations, uh, it can actually go, so let me show you that here. Uh, yeah, let me go back here. 
So you see the difference between 6.25% where the crossover happens at 10 to the minus 8 and 10% where the crossover happens at essentially 10 to the minus 3 is quite large. And so there's a dramatic uh, concentration dependence on this crossover scale. And that's the first sort of puzzling and interesting thing, uh, which is not predicted by anything we know. Uh, the other thing, so by the way, I'm showing this because this is the distribution of the log coordinate of that last downward step, which is the log energy corresponding to the smallest gap in the system. And what we do is we use this as the place where we stop looking at any of these curves. Because beyond that scale, finite size effects will become too important. So we stop here in this case because that's where this peak is. Now here's actually the first clue that tells us that this crossover is something interesting. So what I've done here is I've converted uh, this crossover energy, this energy, 10 to the minus 3 or whatever it is at your concentration, I've converted that into a length scale simply by saying 1 over the length scale square equals the value of the integrated density of states at the crossover energy. So roughly speaking, LC is the mean distance between states that have non-zero energy but energy lower than 10 to the minus gamma C. So that's, that's the crossover scale I define. And I'm plotting that crossover scale against another length scale I can make from the density of zero modes, which is roughly speaking the mean spacing between the positions of the zero modes. Again defined by writing 1 over LW square equals w naught. So you can see, uh, just this is just the raw data plotted. It tracks, these, this length scale tracks this amazingly well. And these error bars on LC are not really error bars. This is a crossover I'm looking at. So there's, you know, some qualitative judgment or, you know, required to decide where's the crossover. So I would say the crossover is between this circle and that circle. And this distance in energies between those two circles is what we are calling the error bar here. Because it's a crossover, it doesn't happen at one place. So you can see it tracks each other really nicely. So somehow the picture is that there's, that vacancies, first of all, induce a thermodynamic density of zero modes in this problem. Uh, and until you go to length scales larger than the typical spacing between these zero modes, the system doesn't know it's supposed to behave in this Garde Wegener two dimensional universality class. And only beyond that length scale it starts behaving like that. That's, that's the conclusion we have. So when we had this story, we were quite puzzled by these zero modes. And we went in circles and decided that one way to think about them might be that even if we have global charge neutrality, you can imagine rare fluctuations where locally there's more A impurities than B, and then that's compensated by some B region somewhere else. And somehow the zero modes must be related to these local imbalances. That was the crude picture. But we couldn't quite make this very precise uh, until we met Lesik Motronik at some workshop. And he managed to supply us a very nice picture. So let me go to the picture first. So this is graphene now. This is not Kitaev. Uh, so I don't put the flux strings. But everything remains the same. All the data will look the same. And what Lesik pointed out is that this crude picture we had in our mind can be made very precise in a very simple way. So just imagine you have vacancies that go and sit in this pattern, like this, on one sublattice. And you can just construct this zero mode now, which lives here. And in spite of the fact that this region is talking to the rest of the lattice and is completely embedded in the lattice, you get an exact zero mode that sits here and doesn't leak out. And because it doesn't leak out, it's an exact zero mode. It doesn't mix with a corresponding mode anywhere else. And so there must be a thermodynamic density of zero modes. And this provides, this picture is actually a lower bound. Because you can say there must at least be as many zero modes as there are, uh, uh, as the frequency for this to happen. And then once you know something's possible, you can do a lot more. So we could actually construct an infinite series of pictures like this that provide a slightly better lower bound. Uh, but I should caution that uh, when we actually look at our numerics, the actual number of zero modes is significantly larger than any of our lower bounds that come from these crude pictures, uh, these very clean, simple pictures. So we believe actually the more generic zero modes do look like this and don't sit in a very narrow, small region of space and are not tied to some very specific relative arrangement of impurities. They are more created by having some region where the boundary is, let's say, all B sites. 
so we have a boundary which is all b sides so all uh, this this region talks to the rest of the system only via b sides and that would suggest it has order perimeter more b sides than a sides in this region yet you have an anomalous dilution that actually produces more a sides in this region as a whole and if that happens it doesn't matter where this dilution is you still have fewer constraints than equations for a zero mode living on the a sub lattice and you can generically get zero modes this way they are not as easy to draw and not as easy to convert into a precise bound but we believe they are the dominant source of zero modes in this problem not these clean pictures but these clean pictures are very nice because they actually give you a clear lower bound which you can compare to so that i jumped ahead and i showed you this picture uh, but let me now go back and convince you that all the physics is the same whether i do graphene or kitai so whichever one i do i have exactly the same density of zero modes uh, crossovers and it's the same physics throughout and again lc tracks lw perfectly so and we can make similar pictures with and without flux strings here are the simplest pictures we can draw for exact zero modes with flux strings and so i would say that we've stumbled on a very interesting uh, crossover in the anderson localization physics in the chiral orthogonal universality class which is very intimately tied to the fact that vacancies put into bipartite random hopping problems generically give zero modes it's very hard to get rid of these more general zero modes because you would need to postulate some very precise correlations that would get rid of every such region and uh, it's hard to imagine how you would do that so any generic vacancy ensemble you make will have a thermodynamic density of zero modes and it will generically lead to this crossover so that's sort of our conclusion and uh, i should say that our conclusion is completely at odds with some work on graphene uh, and earlier work of uh, john chocker's group uh, both of which suggest that this power law form is actually the asymptotically exact result uh, and quote values for the power and we claim that it's a crossover and if you go to lower energies you see the universe in physics and there is this interesting crossover produced by vacancies so that's where i think i will stop and just to acknowledge collaborators as i said lesik motronic played a crucial role in helping us with these bounds in the graphene problem and we got a lot of help from john chocker and roderick mesner in sorting out some subtleties having to do with the projection that connects the kitai model to the free fermion problem so thank you no uh, okay so if there are no questions uh, let's thank kedar again so by the way uh, it uh, i'm really uh, glad that uh, kedar agreed at the last moment to fill in for david hughes whose flight got delayed and uh, as you all, all of you know uh, he's he'll be talking in the afternoon instead of uh, the morning as was scheduled earlier so uh, so it's really uh, great that kedar uh, agreed to fill in at the last minute uh, so let's thank him again <laughs>